guess it's time to go to work. So let me pull out my computer. Bam. <laughs> hey folks, how you doing? Today I've got an absolute treat for you. Uh, what you're looking at here is a luggable machine. I never thought in my days I would get a hold of one of these just because of the cost on eBay and other places. You just don't see these in the wild that much. I thought the closest we'd get on this channel was taking a look at Grateful 42's broken compact portable, which was still interesting to look at. Um, I, I feel like um, Grateful 42 and I are due for another video of that thing. Now that I have this, I, um, we both have luggable machines, so, you know, something to that effect could happen. But before I get even get into that and get completely sidetracked, here we have a special one. I don't know if you can see that there on the camera, but that's, it says IBM Portable Personal Computer. Yes, this is an IBM 5155. This was IBM's first luggable machine that I know of. Um, this was IBM's answer to... The compact portable, believe it or not. The compact portable came first as a significant portable, luggable machine. And the IBM 5155 came afterwards because, you know, they, they, needed to, they needed to answer because the compact was essentially a PC clone. So they came out with their own. And the way they did it, I actually really like. Uh, the case design is much sturdier than the compact. It's not made of all this really brittle plastic and it doesn't creak and all that stuff all the time. Uh, the handle on the IBM is very nice. It's a nice thick metal handle so you can pick it up pretty easily and be confident that the handle will work and your computer won't drop off and fall down. Um, and overall it's thinner than the compact portable as well. I should turn it sideways so you can see that. It's a pretty thin computer. Uh, the compact portable I'd say was about up to there maybe like about to there maybe a little bit a little bit bigger than this this is a very thin machine so it was a very it was a much lower profile computer than the compact portable so in my opinion this is a better computer than the compact portable in just about every way but that doesn't mean there weren't caveats when it was new back in the day the compact portable was a fairly inexpensive machine for the time whereas this IBM was much more expensive at the time and came after the compact portable. So if I was a consumer back then wanting to buy a portable computer, why would I choose the IBM when I know the compact had been around and I'd seen the pricing already and then this comes out and it's way higher. Um, so it was just a, it was a really weird uh, choice to bring this onto market for a more expensive price after the more inexpensive compact portable came out. I think that was a mistake on IBM's part and that's probably why this machine didn't sell very well as nice as it is and we'll get into how nice it is in a little bit now as you heard I plopped it on this desk here and it just kinda of shook the whole desk I don't think that's as impressive as uh, in the Maritime Girls video where she drops it on the floor and it shakes the camera <laughs> basically shakes the house but uh... <laughs> These things are these things are pretty heavy. I mean, in the 80s, you must have had to have been built to carry this thing around in the airport and into your office and whatnot all the time. You would have had some some muscles up there, man. Uh, if you didn't have them before, by the end of the year, by the end of that year at work, you'd definitely have a strong shoulder. I'll tell you that. But there you go. That's sort of an introduction to the IBM Portable Personal Computer 5155. It's basically a portable version of a 5160. It uses the same motherboard as an IBM 5160, so it's an XT machine. Uh, it has an 8088 CPU. Uh, I've put an 8087 math coprocessor in it. Uh, it. This has 256 megs of RAM on the board. I put a low-tech 1 megabyte RAM card in here to bring it up to the full 640K. Uh, it has a CGA video card, but it's a CGA video card that's hooked up to a monochrome monitor. Um, and it also has a serial and parallel card in it as well. In fact, let's just take a look at that. So, let me... Oh. <laughs> it's a bit of a, bit of a big computer. And it has these rubber feet on the bottom, so you can stand it on its back and it won't completely ruin your floor. 
Now, as most of these luggables did, you open it up and you discover that the keyboard is the bottom of the machine itself. And it looks like any other luggable. It looks almost like a piece of radar equipment or something, as I like, like to use to say. But here you go. This is the screen area. Whoops. This is the screen area of the IBM 5155. Uh, you have your monochrome monitor here. It's an amber monochrome display. And the advantage of amber over um, a green phosphor display is that amber is a faster display. It doesn't ghost as much as green does. So depending on which display you like better, it, it wasn't really a choice of... I used to think it was just a choice of color, but really it's more of a choice of uh, uh, response time. Uh, the amber displays have a much faster response time. You get your... Uh, brightness and contrast controls here which they need some deoxid admittedly I haven't gone in there and done that yet and you have two 360k disk drives which both work fine uh, and you have what is essentially the portable version of the Model F keyboard which feels very nice to type on it feels similar to a Model M except it's a much lighter typing feel and it sounds more metallic but it is indeed a buckling spring keyboard and People will say that that's typing nirvana, which it is on a system like this. But honestly, my opinion of these keyboards is that they're better for one reason. A lot of these luggables had keyboards that uh, used contacts with a foam pad on under the keyboard. I'm sure you've seen that in uh, Brent uh, B. Bishop PCM's videos and some other people's videos online. I saw that when he was working on his compact portable probably, I don't know, last couple months or so. I forget, it might have been sometime in 2018, but either way, uh, his had the keyboard, the compact portable, and I think a Panasonic that I've seen as well, that uh, the same guy who had this that I traded with had. Uh, they tend to, the foam pads on those contacts tend to wear out, and the foam deteriorates, so you end up having to repair the whole keyboard the minute you get it. With a buckling spring, that's typically not the case. Every key on this keyboard works. I didn't have to do a thing to it. Uh, the only thing I've really done to this computer is I've, I've attempted to put a, 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 a 1.44 meg drive in here and run it in 720k mode, but the controller had, was having none of it. So I think the real answer to that is to just get an XT IDE uh, card to get some actual fixed disk storage in this thing eventually. Because right now I'm just working with floppies. I'm burning, or burning. I'm writing floppies on a Packard Bell with a 360k drive in it and uh, running programs on this thing. So that's the state of this machine. So that's the front. The keyboard can be taken out as well. If you, if you undo these and just push them together, you can pull the keyboard out and put it in your lap, as you saw that Charlie Chaplin character do a lot in those IBM commercials. Whoa. So now to show you the back of the machine. Okay. On the back of the computer, you got to be careful with this because this, this lids in two pieces, and they like to come. They like to come out. There's like a track below there, but anyway, this is the back of the machine here, as you can see. It has a nice big power button. Ah, satisfying power button. Nice big power supply. Uh, the power supply still works. Surprisingly, I haven't seen the uh, I haven't seen the uh, inrush current limiting capacitor decide to smoke yet which tends to happen on a lot of these old power supplies I'm just waiting for the day when I turn this on and I see a puff of smoke come out of the back and I'll I'll know it's time to go in that power supply and uh, change that capacitor um, so I don't have a whole lot in this machine as you can see it has eight slots which lets you know very quickly that it's an XT machine uh, as opposed to the earlier 5150 machines that had uh, five slots. This is, has eight slots. So what they did essentially in this machine is they took very early 5160 motherboards and stu stuck them in these computers. And these early boards are a little quirky. Um, you could theoretically replace the board with a later revision if you wanted to. Like uh, You would probably want to do that if you were going to install an IBM, not an IBM, if you're going to install an NEC V20 in one of these machines, because these earlier boards don't like those very much. 
So I would replace, if you have one of these and you want to put a V20 in there and you have an earlier version of the uh, 5160 board and they came in these, you might want to replace it with a later revision to put the V20 in there. I've left that, uh, the 51, or the 51, I've left the um, 8088 in here and uh, just added the math coprocessor and that's probably all I'm ever going to do to this thing because the whole point of a machine like this is to run older software, so I've left that alone. The, uh, here's the video card. You get a CGA monitor output and you get a composite output right there. So you can get color out of this machine with the composite. And I can just plug a little TV in there, which will allow me to uh, play things like Planet X3 once I get a hold of that from 8-bit uh, guy. There's a serial and parallel card. So you can plug a mouse in here and I guess a printer in there. Uh, and this is the disk controller. I'm not quite sure what this port does. I'm sure someone in the comments that knows these old machines will chime in, but I'd assume this is for some external storage or uh, something of that type. Not really sure what that this big uh, connector is for. There's a slot blank that's much newer that I put in myself. Behind that is the RAM card, and we'll open this machine up and I'll show you what it looks like inside as well. And you'll see what they did. Um, because they just used a plain desktop board, um, you remember on the front they had that uh, phone jack, the RJ11 style connector where the keyboard plugs in. Well, that runs around the back and plugs into the AT connector on the back of here, or the XT keyboard connector on the back of here. So, you know, just use, they just used d standard desktop stuff and adapted it which I like. That means that finding parts and uh, maintaining this is pretty easy. I like it when these things are a little bit more generic like that. So I'm sure you guys want to see the inside of this thing. So let me open this thing up and we'll show it to you. Now dismantling this ma these machines is not that difficult. All you need is I think just a Torx screwdriver, which is on my floor somewhere here. And what you do is, first of all, you take the keyboard out. That's why you take the keyboard out. There's your phone jack style connector, which converts to the XT keyboard connector. Let's keyboard out of the way. And what you do is there are, let's see if I can balance this. There are three screws on the bottom and three screws on the top here, but under these ridges. And you just unscrew those, and the back comes right off. So it's pretty easy to do. You just have to know where the screws are, and you should be fine. I've, I've used a Torx screwdriver to do this in the past, and that should be all you need. You can also use a flathead screwdriver. It looks like the screws are hex, but I found that a Torx and I have on this LUT screwdriver I have does work fine so yeah that works so you just take these screws out and uh, once you do that pull the back off okay we're recording again alright so I got the screws out now I gotta take this computer and put it on its face And you really got to hold it by the bottom and do this. So yeah, so that doesn't happen. <laughs> so then, once you have the, all six of these screws undone, you just pull the bottom off, and you're looking at the bottom end of the machine. Down on the floor somewhere. There you go. There's a date code down here somewhere. Looks like uh, 41 nine letter T is the date code on the bottom of this, just below the CRT there. Here is the PC speaker. THE PC speaker. <laughs> this one is a uh, Shogyo 8 ohm 0.2 watt Korean speaker. There you go. So it's a fairly big speaker. It's good enough for games and stuff. So let me uh, turn this thing again. Now what they do is similar to what they did to the compact portable. They have all this shielding and stuff all over everything. 
and they used flat blade screws for those, which is annoying. I dislike flat blade because it's so much harder to deal with than something like a Phillips or a GIS screw. So, to get to the cards and all that stuff, you have to take this cage off, which has a screw near the back of the PCI slots here. There's another one on the top here. And then there is another one on the bottom, right under there. There's a little screw down there. Once you have those three screws off, you can just take the shield and pull it right off. And then you have access to the disk drives and the controller cards and all that stuff. So let's take a look at what's in this computer, shall we? Let me get this thing off the tripod. And here we are, the inside of the machine. You have your disk drives here. You have uh, a ribbon cable going into the disk, disk controller back there. So this is your big disk controller. Uh, it's just a, looks like to me it's just a 360K disk controller, which leads me to believe that maybe that's for an external drive on the back. I have no idea. I'm not the most knowledgeable in 80 systems because this is the first one that I've really had. <laughs> now you have your two disk drives here. These are original to the machine. And down here you can see the CPU and the coprocessor. Turn my camera around here so you can see it right side up. There you go. There is the 8088, which is an AMD one, believe it or not. So, Team Red, man. <laughs> and uh, this is the math coprocessor that I installed, which is looks which is an original Intel one with that little gold thing on it, which looks kind of neat. Looks really 80s. Um, there's the power supply connectors there. All the RAM is underneath the cards and stuff over here. See if I can get a view down there. You can see those RAM chips hiding under there. All the RAM chips are good, which is nice. Uh, there's your CGA video card right there. It's the original uh, IBM one. It says color graphics on it right there. Unfortunately, the monitor is not color. And here's a serial and parallel card that was put in here. I don't know how original this is. It might, it might have come with this. I'm not sure, but that at least allows me to use a mouse and possibly a printer. And look at all this room for expansion. The only trouble is, as you can see, the disk drives sort of budge right up against the slots there. So you're limited to short cards like this RAM expansion that I've put in here. This is a low-tech one megabyte RAM board. And uh, I have this set up to give me the full 640K since going above 640K on a machine like this is pretty pointless. <laughs> if this was something like a 286, maybe, but... Eh. In a computer like this, you really don't need much more than 640K. And I know what you're going to say. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is there's a trim pot down there, as you can see. I wonder what that's for. My pure dumb luck guess is that that is for the volume of the PC speaker. Um, but I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But this is a standard IBM... 5160 XT motherboard. So, if the board like this ever goes bad in your IBM, you can replace it. No big deal. So, that's what the inside of the machine looks like and what it's like to work inside. There's a lot of protection and a lot of stuff going on in there. So, mostly everything in here is all original to the way I got it, apart from this RAM expansion board. So, that this at least lets me run more software. So, that adds to the 256K that was already on the motherboard. So, there's not much to see under the CRT. I don't know who makes the tube or anything like that, and I don't really want to undo it to find out. <laughs> so, because uh, it all works. There's no reason to open it. But there you go. There's at least some stuff back here. The power supply is made in Mexico, but the computer was made in the USA. And there you go. And there's that... Uh, Here's that connector that plugs into the keyboard. It's literally, literally they just used an AT connector, or an XT connector in this case, I guess, and just plugged it straight in and then converted that to uh, 
that RJ45 type connector. Which I don't think is RJ45, but it's the same, you know, connector. Anyway, that's the inside of the machine. Let's button this thing back up and I'll show you some programs. Okay, this thing's buttoned back up. Now, as you can see from inside that machine, it, it, it's a hell of a lot easier to uh, work on one of these. Or at least it's easier to get into one of these than it is the compact portable. The compact portable is a battle fortress inside, full of plates and covers and stuff. Whereas this isn't nearly as bad as that. This is just like a, the, the top cover and a little bit of shielding. That's about it. There we go. Okay, now let's plug this guy in. And boot it up for your viewing pleasure. Okay, uh, card here, I have it plugged into this Variac back here, if that's viewable on camera. I have that set to 120 volts because my apartment tends to have a really high voltage for some reason. So a lot of, a lot of the stuff here on the test bench, I plug into that Variac to keep the voltage low. So. With any luck, we'll get a poof of smoke on camera, right? <laughs> so let's turn the Variac on. And the VU meter bounces just above in the upper range of the green. So I think my floppy disks are over here. I've got this like bunch of 3M ones here. Yeah. Yeah, these are, these are the DOS 5 disks that I have. Uh, and a dead copy of exploring the IBM personal computer. That's nice. So, good. I got those floppies. And I have the floppy the machine came with over here somewhere. Oh, where did I put that? Oh, here it is. Came with this. Didn't come in the sleeve. I just happened to have it. But DOS 2.1. PC DOS 2.1. So this is a very early version of DOS. And... The, int the new intro that I've started using this year, you might, you might uh, recognize the screen and recognize the DOS prompt uh, from this disk, so let's put the boot disk in there. Well, let's not boot from it first, though. Let's, let's take a look at what this thing does when you boot without a disk in it. Smoke test! As you can hear, that power supply fan sounds like a hard drive. It's ridiculous. Let me zoom into the screen here so you can see the RAM count. Stupid tripod, come on. Cooperate. There you go. See, it's counting past 256 because that RAM because that RAM card I put in there. It takes a while. A while. To uh, count all this RAM. So even if you did put one meg in here, you'd be waiting a while. So I'll get up to 640k there and then uh, you'll see it boot. And there you go. It'll try to read the drive for a while. But then it goes into basic. And you know what that means. that we have some messing around to do, right? Oh, I spelled 20 go to 10 wrong, whoops. There you go. Flicker, 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 flicker. No, I think we have to again to stop it. F8. Where's the brake key? Control brake? There we go. So you hit control brake to get out of that. And then, uh, yeah, there you go. You can do basic stuff in here. And I have more basic stuff on a floppy that I'm going to show you later. All right, so let's put the disc in and boot. Put that lever down. Do a three-finger salute. 
and boot the DOS 2.1. Current date is enter. <laughs> and there you go. It's IBM PC DOS. Two point one. Very early version of DOS. As you can see, there's no ghosting at all in this amber display because it's a very fast, responsive display. There you go, there's your check disk right there. You have uh, there's 640K of RAM there and there's 625 free at the moment. Anything else on this disk that's worth looking at? Eh, probably not. There's not a whole lot on DOS 2.1, I'll tell you that. So I think what we should do is play some games. So let me uh, get some different floppies out. We will have a good old time. So I think this is the DOS 5 startup disk I have, so let's see what this one's all about. Pretty sure this is DOS 5. Wow, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, you know what helps? It's to put the lever down the disk drive. The things you forget. <laughs> this is not a quiet computer by any means. That fan and the power supply probably need some attention, and this, these floppies are pretty loud. Catchphrase! <laughs> yeah, that was something that, uh, uh, Nilbud, you might remember from, uh, some of my older videos. Or, or my other videos, Retro Software with Dave. He and I were messing with this machine one day while he was down here. And uh, we put catchphrase as a startup thing. So this should be DOS 5. Which doesn't have a whole lot on it right now, actually. All right, let's see what's on some of these disks I have here. So go to drive B. Show you that the second floppy drive works. And that's Alley Cat. I don't know how to play this game at all, so you're gonna watch me just completely suck at it. But as you can see, games work on it. You want to use a joystick? No. I'm a kitten. I'm terrible. Uh. Pause mode. Oh, come on, man. Come on. Use the con use the cursor keys to control the cat. Use the Alt key to perform special actions. Okay. So, arrow keys are on in the numpad on the old 84 key keyboard. Okay, jump is up. Let's see how bad I am at this game. Ow. Aw, cat fight. Oh, did I hit the power line? What did I do? What? I'm so confused. Oh, I'm gonna die again. Uh, I'm really bad at this game, but <laughs> as you can see, it definitely works. I forget how to quit, so I'm just gonna reboot. Catchphrase! Let's see if we can make this run. Uh, 
I want to say IBM Bio. Oh god, what's going on? That's very interesting. I think I crashed the computer. Yeah, I crashed the computer. Well, that was interesting. I'm not running that again. Okay. Let's go to drive B. And this is the basic disk, so... Yeah, it was QBasic. Let's go into QBasic. Look at that. QBasic. It's a newer version of it. So let me go into the menu here and uh, let's open up Gorilla.basic. Where's the tab key? Select that one and open that. <laughs> Loading and parsing is what it says. And there's a little counter at the bottom there. basic gorillas. Your mission is to hit the opponent with the exploding banana by varying the angle and power of your throw. There's the code. Well, not code, it's just declares, I guess. Yeah, there you have it. So why don't we go over to run and see what we can do. There we go, Q basic gorillas. Let's see what this is all about. Name of player one. I don't know who player two is going to be. Default. Default. Let's view the intro. Hey, the city looks pretty good, though. So, I guess you hit the other player with the banana. So this is a bit like Worms, in a way, I guess. You ever play Worms Armageddon or something? I guess that's basically what this is. Let's try a 45 degree angle. Velocity, uh, 7. <laughs> I literally killed myself with a banana. Yeah, I got it like that, 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 that. <laughs> you can see how slow this 8088 is, how it just keep just draws the, the graphics on the screen. Although, in basic, it's pretty loose to call these graphics, I guess. Okay, let's see if I can do this as player two. Okay, let's do a 70 degree angle with a velocity of 150. That's a little better. You can see that banana just going way high.
Wow, I just threw it up in the sky and it didn't go anywhere. All right. Let's do a 60 degree angle with 80 velocity and see what happens. It's really hard to tell what the physics are in this. Do I hit the sun? I hit the sun! <laughs> oh, that's funny. So if you hit the sun, it doesn't count. All right. 60, let's do a 56 degree angle with a velocity of 70. Uh, is it going to come back down? Yeah, maybe not. This this game is a little weird. It's almost like you need to know physics properly. <laughs> I don't know, man. 56 seemed like a good angle, so I'm going to try the velocity of 40. I am so done with this game, dude. It shouldn't be this hard to throw a dang banana. I'm so done. Alright, let's reboot out of that. Well, that was an example of a Q-Basic game. There's another one that's a bit like Snafu. Okay, so this is a money manage management software, so... This is something probably a little more IBM, as it were, so. Let's see what this looks like. This is from 1990. So it's about six years newer than the machine. This machine's from 1984. Okay, so... I don't have any accounts at the moment. There you go. There's a uh, account title. Checking. Description. Money. Stuff. Man. I don't know what A and L means, so I'm just going to put A. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It's a bit like a, a ledger type of thing, I guess. So you can just make account titles. So A is asset, and L is liability. So I made checkings and asset and savings a liability. <laughs> That's terrible. transactions. So I've added a few accounts to it. Reports. Net worth report. So this is a super, super simple like finance program, which isn't much use to me when we have things like online banking and spreadsheet programs and stuff like that. Even back then there were spreadsheet programs. So not really sure why you needed all, all that kind of stuff. Now one thing I got with this machine that was very special is DOS 3.3, both discs and the manual. I think we should give this a shot. And DOS 3.3 is also more error appropriate for a machine like this. DOS 5 has a lot of useful stuff in it, but DOS 3.3 is definitely of the era. Okay. DOS 3.3. So let's go to the B drive. I believe there's some stuff on there that you're going to want to see. There's GW Basic on this disk.
which is your gen standard GW basic thing. So. I think I got a reboot to get out of that. So you got your GW basic interpreter, which to me looks exactly the same as what's built into the ROM on the IBM in the first place. DOS 3.3 has a bunch of utilities on it already, which is kind of nice. But, I figured I'd show you that. The discs work that I got with this computer. And uh, I've got full, fully functional copy of DOS 3.3, which is really cool to have, because I didn't have really any of this stuff until this trade I did. So I'm very thankful for the people that I meet doing this stuff. There, booting back into DOS 5. Let's go to drive B and see what's on here. DOS shell. Now that's something that I should show you guys. Um, I should probably plug in a mouse first. But uh, we'll check it out anyway. It's loading it. Slowly but surely. And there's DOS shell. Because the arrow buttons don't seem to work. Unless I go over to B. There we go. So there's DOS shell, there's your basic uh, sort of interface. It doesn't look that great in amber chrome, in an amber uh, monochrome CGA. Unless I adjust the colors here, let's see. Monochrome, four colors. That looks a little better. So you can adjust the color settings and all that stuff in these programs. Shell basics. Huh. Yeah, the help file, of course, isn't on this drive it's or on this disk. It's on another one. The real next step for this machine is to get an XT IDE interface so that I can plug in a CF card or SD card adapter into this so that we can have just software on here, which is why I don't have too many games or floppies written for things like software. Most of this stuff is DOS 5, believe it or not. Uh, supplemental disks, uh, other disks. That's really all we got. So I, I honestly don't have a whole lot. But there you go. That is a uh, that is a first introduction to the IBM 5155 portable personal computer. It's a pretty cool machine. This is my first machine of this era that I've ever had. I have never had any computer running an 8088 or even anything as far back as a 386, 286, or 8086, so this is pretty cool to have. It's a very nice machine, it's in very good shape, it runs great. Uh, I couldn't be more thankful to have it, thanks to uh, some other YouTubers that I know. Put this DOS disk away somewhere. And there you go. Uh, I wish I had more software to show you, but uh, I think like I kept saying before, that I really need to get an XTIDE fixed disk storage device for this thing so that I can put all of it on here and we aren't stuck with, you know, money managers and basic programs and that one floppy valley cat that I have because we had made more, uh, Dave and I had made more, but unfortunately I think we were using that one disk for all of it. So I don't have the computer that writes floppies out right now. But this, this is enough of a demonstration to show you sort of what the machine can do and 
all the stuff I have for it so far and um, what it's all about. So I think that we will leave other software for future videos so that we can bring this thing out. Because after all, that's what I wanted this thing for, so that we can mess with the old software. And once I have fixed disk storage, it's going to be a lot easier and a lot more convenient to do that in video format. So once I have that all together, you'll probably be seeing more of this machine. But I just wanted to introduce you to this thing. This beautiful, beautiful IBM 5155 personal computer. Wonderful, wonderful machine. I'm glad to have it in my possession. So thank you again, Kyle, for uh, doing this this deal with me. Uh, this is definitely a fun thing to go back to the 80s and take a look at the early PC stuff. So We'll be looking at more software in the future. We'll be looking at the uh, XT IDE interface and installing it as well. So this is just an introduction to this IBM 5155 and there will be more to come on this machine in the future. If you'd like to reach me on social media, I'm available on Twitter and Reddit as you'll find down below. And if you'd like to join our Discord community, there's also link, a link for that down below, uh, too. So, anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this video, and have a good one, everybody. Ciao.